Welcome to the People and Planet Conversation Series. My name is Melissa Kenny, and I'm the Associate Director of Knowledge Initiatives and an Environmental Decision Scientist at the University of Minnesota's Institute on the Environment, or as we call it, i and &E. I'm so thrilled to have you here today. We have an exciting conversation planned. The Institute on the Environment is an interdisciplinary hub. We are a place devoted to bringing people together to make progress on complex challenges our world faces. The kind of challenges that demand a diversity of skills and expertise. And that's why we're here today. 2020 has brought both challenges and change, hurdles and momentum. So much has been put on display. Fragile systems and structures, deep inequities, and dynamics of power and implicit priority and also astonishing resilience and adaptation. And so we wanted to create a place with humility for critical reflection, for asking questions and talking about ideas to help us understand how we might learn and evolve and position ourselves for a better future. Because one thing is clear, it's all connected. In that spirit today, we're going to ask the question, how might we build a more resilient, equitable food system? We'll dig into the continuum of global to local food systems, implications for sustainability in supply chains, and creating a system that serves us all. Unfortunately, one example of a continuous issue within the supply chain is showing up today. Chris Fields, president of Fields Produce and Foods Incorporated planned to join us and is unable to make it due to last minute staffing constraints. But we have two superstars who are here today. Today, our guests are Jennifer Schmidt, who is an INE lead scientist who specializes in agricultural supply chain sustainability across the US meat and commodity crop sectors. We also have Kathy Drager, who is a statewide director of the University of Minnesota's Extension Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Her research includes rural food distribution, local and regional food distribution, and rural grocery store persistence. I've invited our panelists to provide some remarks to set the stage, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thanks to those of you who have already shared questions when registering. You can also use the Q&A function during the event to share your questions and who you are, and our event moderator will pass them along to me. So are we ready to go? Jennifer, do you wanna kick it off? Happy to, thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon, everybody. I wanna begin by talking about our current food system, specifically how the majority of the meat produced in the US gets to be on your plate. So meat in the US begins with corn and soybeans. There are exceptions, nuances, and variations, of course. But on average, and for the vast majority of US meat, corn and soy make up the largest feed ingredients. These crops are grown across the United States, and they move by barge, rail, and truck to feed mills or on-farm storage, where they're mixed with other small amounts of ingredients to make an animal feed ration. These feed rations are science, highly developed to achieve optimal animal growth targeted to various life stages of the particular livestock. From those feed mills, we move to the farm or the feedlots. In the case of hogs and chickens, the farms are highly controlled environments to minimize stress from nature's abundance of temperatures, weather, and infectious disease. Beef is a little different with a grazing stage where they graze on pasture land and are moved to feedlots with controlled feed rations. But the goal here is to get the animals to cl as close as possible to an optimal weight to get the highest price from the processors or the slaughter facilities. The processors are tailored for specific type, size, and species of animals. From there, the meat is further processed and goes from to storage and distribution facilities, wholesalers that end up in restaurants, grocery stores, and ultimately end up on your plate. If this system sounds mechani mechanistic, it is. We are highly efficient at producing meat. The US produces over 27 billion pounds of pork and beef each year. 
we produce over 58 billion pounds of chicken. And much of this is consumed within the United States. On average, Americans consume about three times the global, global average of meat. Despite this, about 10% of our beef, over a quarter of our pork, and about a little over 15% of our chicken is exported to the rest of the world. And as many of you are highly aware, there's an environmental cost to all of this. But the precision diets, the genetics, the controlled environment, and other industry improvements that we've had over the decades has decreased the total environmental impact of much of this meat production. How much more the industries can reduce their environmental footprint remains an open research question, and many meat companies are interested in finding increased sustainability uh, aspects to their meat production. So this mechanistic, efficient, mass production supply chain system gives us cheap meat. Meat in the US is actually moderately priced compared um, to the rest of the world, definitely compared to Europe, where meat prices can be more than twice as high as in the US, um, or in parts in Asia, where many people can barely even afford the meat. And furthermore, in the United States, we're about 14th out of 50, ranked 14th out of 50 in terms of um, being affordable so that the local people within the U.S. can actually afford that meat. So we have affordable, relatively cheap meat. However, as we saw this spring, this system that gives us this, this meat at an increasingly lower cost environmentally is not resilient, at least not when you have a major shock like COVID-19. As the slaughter plants closed, animals quickly became too big for slaughter facilities. These slaughter facilities that remained open were glutted with supply. And then in the small remaining um, slaughter facilities or, or even butcher shops, at least um, in my contacts with I in Iowa, shared that they were booked out through 2020 back in May. So the ability for our system to deal with this big shock, as, as many of you know, um, was, was highly problematic. And this highlighted another issue with our food system, one that has always been there, um, but has became glaringly front and center during COVID, and this is food waste. So going to the other end of our supply chain here, about 30 to 40% of total food goes to wait, waste, excuse me, globally and in the United States. It's a pretty consistent across the globe. Although where in the supply chain that waste occurs differs. In the United States, more than half of food waste occurs during the consumption stage. So this is on grocery stores, restaurants, at homes. What COVID showed us was food waste at the production side, where we had our fields of lettuce or our milk dumping um, going to waste. And this was shocking, but under normal times, only about 10 to 20% of food waste actually occurs in the production phase because of the system we've created, because we have cold storage, um, because we can move things relatively quickly before they go bad, um, et cetera. And so um, what we've realized is that we have a little bit of an issue at this production stage, but still a whole lot of this issue down at the, at the consumption stage. And then we sit with that in contrast to the issue of hunger. It also has come up in terms of COVID and with, the um, racial disparities that are going on and that are highlighted right now in the US. We're really seeing a lot of issues um, in hunger. In fact, in Minnesota, about one in 11 people struggle with hunger. It's one in eight children. And even uh, the University of Twin Minnesota Twin Cities campus had a study that showed that one in 10 students have reported that they don't have adequate food. And about 17 and a half percent of them worried that they'd run out of food. The type of food waste that we primarily have and this issue of hunger are not always easily meshed together because the places that we're having food waste, again, largely at the household level, are not in a, in a form that we can then move them to solve the issue of hunger. And with that, I'm gonna stop kind of with the framing of how I see the supply chain and, and listen to what Kathy has to say. Thanks, Jennifer. Kathy? Yes, hello everybody. I'm uh, Kathy Drager. And just in the interest of full disclosure, um, as well as being um, 
the statewide director of the regional partnerships um, and an adjunct professor of agronomy and plant genetics. I actually live and farm in Big Stone County, Minnesota, where um, we produce organic row crops and small grains, edible beans, as well as about half our farm is in intensely rotationally grazed um, beef as well. So I just want to put my who I am out there for you as well as an academic. Um, so I so appreciate everything Jennifer said, and my first point before I'd even heard what Jennifer said is that indeed we have created a very elegant globalized food system. It is very efficient. For many Americans it is cheap, um, but it is not resilient. And so I think we are probably in full agreement on, on that point. And, and part of this conversation is about what makes a food system resilient. And I know that over probably the last 20 years, we're seeing a resurgence in interest in local foods. This has kind of ebbed and flowed um, you know, over the past decades, um, but folks are aware that we've had just an increase in farmer's market, increase in CSA, increase from direct from farmers. Even the United States Department of Agriculture produced a know your farmer. So this emphasis on buy local, I think is part of the solution that we have um, for what is a resilient food system. And that's not just in, in Minnesota or in the United States, but that's actually a, a global strategy for resilient food system is where communities have access to food that they are producing themselves. Um, I think Michael Pollan um, kind of emphasized, you know, about 10 years ago, his book that said, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I think there's a lot of agreement that that's a good way to, to be um, healthy. So I think there's things that build resilience into our food system at the individual level, the community level, and the systemic level. Um, so in terms of uh, some of those um, individual choices, really, when we are looking at where we, those of us who are on this webinar, those people that you know, where you can have an impact in this food system is you make a choice every time you spend a dollar of your food dollars. So I think it's very empowering that we have the opportunity to um, make those choices every day with our food dollar. And so I just encourage people to vote, vote with those dollars about what you're looking for in your food system. Um, I think that um, on, a, on a little bit larger scale and um, I think that the community, on the community level, we have seen the farmer's share of the food um, dollar. So for every dollar that's spent on food, the farmer's amount has consistently dropped. And in fact, last May, it was the lowest since we started keeping the data in 1993, which is farmers get about 14 cents of your food dollar. So that's something that you should keep in mind because our cheap food policy um, has really constrained farmers and the system that farmers use. And this efficient global corn soybean system is part of the stress that is being put on farmers and uh, living in a farm community. And just for those of us who are familiar with, I mean, it's, it's been in the news. We are in a farm crisis right now. Farm prices are, are very low. But this has been going on for a number of years. As I said, the farmer's share of the food dollar is the lowest since 1993. Um, and in fact, I might just quickly um, share a slide that shows uh, some of the, um, the farm dollar. I'm going to put share my screen right now for just a second. Okay. So, oops, sorry, this is in the way. So um, I just, this is, sorry, this is such a busy slide, but I just wanted to point out that just historically, um, you know, farmers receive a small amount of the actual price of the crop. So when you buy, let's say your cereal for $3.49 a box, which actually seems, you know, depending on what cereal you're buying, that's not an, on a, I mean, that's in the price range. Farmers get five cents uh, of the raw ingredients that go into the box. And you might think that during a pandemic, when we are actually seeing impacts in the supply chain, as Jennifer pointed out with the meat supply chain, you might think that maybe farmers did a little bit better, but they didn't. 
um, that bottleneck, the price of beef went up and the amount that the farmer received went down. So uh, before the pandemic, farmers were getting about 50% of the cost of beef and at, during the pandemic, so in June, they were getting about 34%. So, um, so there are other things in this food system that point towards, while it may be efficient, I think we can all, and the question of equity is such a good question, and I'm so pleased that we're all asking ourselves that question right now. The question of equity in our food system is a good one, and I think we can agree that uh, there are parts of this system that are not fair. Um, I'm gonna just talk really briefly about this report. Uh, we released it in January. It was called the Halal and Kosher Meat Market Assessment, and I believe the link went out. So anyone can take a look at this report that would like to, and we welcome you to look at it and, and think about how this could fit into your work or, or your um, interests. But one of the really big take home messages, and this fits in with the equity, is that we have a population that likes goat meat, and we really right now are importing nearly 100% of the goat meat that's eaten in Minnesota. And um, our data show that's well over 100,000 goats per year. Some estimates were closer to a half million. And those, that goat is imported frozen from Australia and New Zealand into Minnesota. And I think this is just a really good case study of how we can have a system that is equitable, it is feeding people in a way that they want to have access to food. And with, the, with halal and kosher, I'll just give you an example. I mean, I think there's opportunities for emerging farmers. This, is a, this could be a grass-fed system. This does not have to be a confined animal feeding operation system. We're at the beginning of what this system could look like in Minnesota. We have the opportunity to build something that is ecologically sound. Um, I farm on the tall grass prairie in western Minnesota. This is a landscape. This is an ecology that evolved with ruminants. This is part and parcel of our ecology. And so there's an opportunity to reintroduce those ruminants. And I'm a member of a number of uh, sustainable farming associations, you know, locally, statewide, and nationally. And sustainable farmers who, like some of my friends and people I'm acquainted with organic farmers started taking animals off the landscape and just really focus on organic row crops and now we have an opportunity a lot of these farmers are saying that was a mistake we need sustainable farms need animals grazing converting some of the grass into manure providing that fertilizer providing that soil health you know repopulating the microbes making it work so we have an opportunity to incorporate animals back into our our, our agriculture system in a way that can be profitable, it can be just, it can be equitable, and it can be environmentally sound. And I think I, I hold that strong opportunity uh, out for myself and for other, other farmers. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about that. We released this uh, report in January um, and then COVID. So we haven't been able to take as much action on it as we'd like, but as we all are catching our breath, um, I think there is more opportunity for us to really think about what um, a, a, a system could look like that's healthy, equitable, and, um, and feeding us. Um, and just, I ate goat meat yesterday, um, and it was produced here in Big Stone County by two, uh, we have two, uh, it was actually the park ranger from Big Stone Park. They use the goats to control the buckthorn, and then they harvest them in the fall, and so, I had the opportunity, you know, right here that there, there's multiple ways we can fit some of these ruminants into our landscape in a way that is beneficial because they like to eat buckthorn for one thing. Um, I talked about the farmer share. Um, I want to talk about one piece of food system resilience in the supply chain. Um, and this is a model we've been working on for a couple of years. We call it backhaul. We're updating our language, calling it a bi-directional supply chain right now. But I want, to, I want to point this out because when COVID started, and I was talking to wholesalers and grocers around the state, we were having supply chain shortages. And not just toilet paper, but I, I have had calls 
um, that were very serious and very concerned about the, the products and the food that were missing from the supply chain. You may have heard that there had been runs on, for example, spaghetti in the Dakotas, that there were shortage of, of certain kinds of produce. Although, I mean, we also are able, we've, we've been able to adjust and I'm really pleased. Our supply chains have held really reliably. I mean, I talked to wholesalers, I talked to grocers, um, you know, not just in Minnesota, but around. But this system, this backhaul system, I'll call it, is really, if, if we needed a plan B for supply chain. Now, I love my coffee. I love cinnamon. I like all those things. Give me a good banana in my smoothie. You know, I'm not a purist. Um, so I want a global supply chain. I like those things. You know, global supply chains have been around for millennia. And they're not going to go away. But how could we do this if we needed a plan B? If there was some, for some reason, we were not able to import the food that we are eating, you know, there is an opportunity to look at the existing assets we have on the landscape. Small and medium sized farms, which are more likely to be food producing farms. We have still have about 250 small town grocery stores in communities with populations 2,500 and less. And they are dotted throughout farm country. So at any given time, a farmer could go from within about a 15 mile radius to a small town store. I'm, I'm going across this graphic. Those small town stores generally receive two wholesale grocery shipments a week. The truck comes, unloads your bananas, your cinnamon, your pepper, your coffee, your beef, pork, diapers, and cigarettes, you know, just saying. And then that truck goes back to the wholesale warehouse and it's empty when it arrives. What if we piggyback at the grocery store, the farmer meets them, loads your carrots, strawberries, barley, edible beans, potatoes, whatever crop we're producing at the local level, and we're able to take that back to the wholesale warehouse, and then it can be redistributed throughout the state. And in fact, we have tested this. We have regulatory approval to do this, not with all crops, but with a few crops. For example, um, we did it with garlic, which is shelf stable. It's okay at room temperature. People eat it cooked, low food safety. It was all good. We actually tested it. And, and garlic made its way into the major urban centers from a very remote rural farm. Um, and so we know that this can work. So I see this as one of those, like if we needed to deploy something right now to keep Minnesotans fed, we could deploy a system that would get crops. Um, using the existing assets of existing wholesale routes, existing grocery stores, these existing relationships don't need to be rebuilt. And we could, it, we could make this work to uh, be our, actually, I actually see this as plan D. We got a plan A, B, C. This is plan D if we needed to deploy it because of uh, supply chain disruptions. So, um, and then there's just one thing, I'm, I'm just going to wrap up now. No one's cute flagged me yet, but I just want to say this is personal note. This is slightly academic because I do have really detailed soil analysis of my farm, but apart from being a soil scientist and reading soil, I do not have any large scale metadata I'm drawing this from. I'm telling you that when I, I, I took these two pictures on the same day, standing in the same spot, I was standing in my driveway. To the south, which is the left hand picture, to the south is our rotational grazing. Um, it's, it's lush, it's beautiful, it is covered with grass and forbs and plants and animals. It's full of, it has fox and voles and moles and mice and birds and meadowlarks and pollinators. And um, it's, it's in frogs, the frogs are echoing throughout. And then I turn to my right, I'm looking north, and this is our much loved pampered organic cropland. And this is on June 3rd. And this is where we raise our edible, we've raised our organic edible beans, black beans, if you like black turtle beans. This is where we raise barley um, and those crops. And this is what these two look like on June 3rd. And I will tell you that our row crops, that, that is, we, we just, and in this picture we had just um, plowed down our cover crop. So it was green the day before, but it was, it turned black on June 3rd. That was the picture I was taking because we had to plow in the cover crop to plant a grain and it's dead. There's no fox, there's no nest, there's no pheasants, there's no voles, there's no pollinators. 
And, and so when we talk about what is an ecologically sound way to eat, I, I want to say that I always lean towards my pampered organic acres, which I walk on and pull weeds and baby and talk to and all that good stuff. And I love my edible beans and I'm probably having barley for lunch. So, um, so, but I'm telling you in terms of beauty, which I think is a part of resilience and sustainability as well. The grazing is beautiful. I have metal arcs. When we bought this farm 12 years ago, my husband and I agreed one of our goals was to have metal arcs on the farm. We do, but only on the south side of our farm, right? My, my son has actually gone out to try to save pheasant eggs when we are, when we are planting in our, our, our certified organic fields. So I, I don't know how to say this, except there is a certain amount of death that comes along with us eating grains and eating edible beans. Um, and that's why I think what Michael Pollan says is, you know, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, but not only plants, because if you can afford to buy from a farmer you know that um, uses intention, uses rotational grazing in an intelligent way, and, and we do have advocates like the Sustainable Farming Association that are training farmers all over the state to do this. That, that it can be a part of what makes a beautiful, resilient, robust landscape. Um, and so I think we need to change our conversation over time about, about what is resilient. And I think- That's a great segue, Kathy. And I'm wondering if I might be able to jump in because Beth from St. Paul shared that she's a satisfied purchaser of your beef and vegetables through the <laughs> Consumer Supported Agriculture, the CSA. And so she knows where you suggest you put um, her dollars. But there were a couple of questions coming from Beth and other participants asking about how can you find information, both local and global, about whether your food is sustainable. So as consumers, we actually can't vote with our dollars. For example, do we avoid certain high-impact foods? Do we look for labels and assessments of sustainability? What should we do to be smart consumers? Um, so, so I can take a stab at it. Maybe Jennifer has some as well. Um, so I mean, I, I, uh, before I farmed, I lived in St. Paul and I would uh, sign up for CSAs and I would also buy my meat directly from farmers and um, I would talk to those farmers. I did actually about what their practices were, not in, as in depth as I probably would now. Um, but so you can ask those questions. Minnesota Grown is a great resource. Um, so you can click on a map and you can find farms near you. They give you the contact information, telephone numbers, emails, websites. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities to, to look and find those foods. Um, and I think it's great if we do that for our families. I would just say one part of um, equity could also be if you are looking to make donations to our food shelf. I know we have food shelf, it, food shelf drives are a big thing in like, for example, the place I live. Um, and then I try to donate uh, local where I can, like our, you know, like barley or whole grains, you know, sometimes the meat and the vegetables are more complicated, but I think there's opportunities to even insert those into the, um, you know, the, the food pantry community as well. Yeah, I don't know if that helps, but. Mm -hmm. That's, that's great. Jennifer? Yeah, so um, I just want to echo Kathy's point of vote with your dollar. I am a big proponent of that and try and I live by that a lot. And I think in purchasing sustainable X, Y, or Z, that's a great way to do it. Um, I agree with CSAs and farmers markets. Um, I will point out that we're hitting, you know, what's one to two percent of people do CSAs or something really small like that. Like we're hitting a, a niche there and great for all of you online watching this who can do that. But from an equity standpoint, that we're, we're, and from an actual moving the needle standpoint, we're, we just don't have enough with that, um, at least now, to change the, the system. And that's why I started ex with my talk about this just big system, because I, I think it's important to realize that these, you know, Kathy's farm is amazing. And then there's the average, and that's what I, you know, was trying to hit there. And so from that, 
point. Labels are helpful. Um, they can be a proxy. I mean, even the organic label that has lots of problems I, and is, is a proxy. Um, and we, I'm sure everyone's talked about free range and the issues with that. Um, but I, I think that right now for consumers, that's a large part of what they have. Um, if you do have a little more time thinking about um, looking at the companies and so what particular companies are doing in terms of trying to achieve sustainability. Um, I, I wanted to also bring that up because, you know, Kathy's mentioning how little the farmers get and yet all of the, the vitriol, not all, but a lot of it and the, the push on who needs to change is all, sitting on the farmer and it's frankly unfair that they need to make all these improvements by making very little money on the dollar of their products and but that's where the impacts are they're on the farm and so that's why it's happening and so so looking at companies and understanding who's working to share the costs of sustainability improvements who's putting money where their mouth where their mouth is in terms of the company themselves to improve the landscape um, I would you know I would encourage you to, to shop from those particular companies um, and, and sorry one final point just well two so so barring um, the time to do all this, um, this is where something universal like a carbon tax could bring what we all use to make our decisions, which is money, and bring it to the forefront. But it has to be applied universally um, in order to, to have that signal be there. Um, and I forgot the other point, so I'm going to stop there and I'm sure it will pop back into my head after this. Well, and Jennifer, that's a that's a great segue because we basically got this continuum of some people really wanting to know individually what they could do and others really wanting to have this idea of what are some of the institutional changes that are needed for healthy, equitable, sustainable food systems. So um, I'm wondering if we can dive into that piece of it just a little bit more. And you brought up carbon tax as one mechanism. Um, and so there were some questions that arose from a number of our participants um, who chose to say anonymous. Um, for example, one participant, Catherine, is interested in, do you have policy suggestions that support small growers of local foods? And other participants who were interested about policies that incentivize sustainability um, within the larger food production process. So Jennifer, since you teased us with a little bit of these policy changes. Do you want to pick up first? Sure, and, and I can be brief, partially because I'm not a policy expert. Um, I've not scoured the farm bill, but I know a lot of people do, and there are many problems in how, what is incentivized by existing right. policies in terms of what we grow, and also disincentives for, for changing out of it. Um, and, <laughs> I, I think that the this policy, like looking at the policies and what they're bolstering up is kind of step number one of fixing it. Um, an another piece that I know is broken that is, that, you know, smarter people than I are working on are um, crop insurance and the whole insurance system sitting there. It's a big problem in terms of switching over to or adding in cover crops and dealing with crop insurance. So um, those pieces fix what's, what's already being a problem and then adding on new things and that's where I'll go back to my carbon tax. But Kathy, I'm sure you have actual experience with some of these policies. And well, and I will say that one of the issues of supporting local foods is if I, any farmer who grows corn or soybeans on their farm, you can go to, a, I live in a very remote rural place, but there are probably at least six places within 20 miles where I could bring in a semi truck of corn or soybean and get a market price for it. That is not the case with edible beans. That is not the case with barley. I have to set up those markets by myself in advance. And it's even worse if you're growing something like strawberries, right? Because you, you know, that is a very sensitive crop that has to be handled carefully with refrigeration and food safety concerns. So, um, I mean, that was why we started looking at that backhaul project, is that we needed to find points of market access. So if you're growing a crop, you can get it into the wholesale supply so that if you don't have, are in a place where you don't have the farmer's market, you don't have a CSA, um, you maybe 
other than getting in your truck and driving around and knocking on grocery store doors to sell, you know, what are our options? And so that's what we started working on this as, yes, it helps build a resilient food system in case there is a disruption in the supply chain, but it also our really our motivation was to create, it's called an intermediated market, like someone who's gonna sell your food for it, create an intermediate um, market for local foods using the existing assets. Let's not build a whole new thing. Let's not buy a new truck. Let's not start up a new supply chain. Let's not get five new apps, right? Let's just use what we've got. Let's see what assets we have on the landscape and how we can use them. Small farms, small grocery store, wholesale routes that, that serve hundreds of grocery stores in our region. So, so that's, if you, in terms of what we can do to help, that's why we are really trying to invest in learning how to make this work. And our hope is, um, we'll be able to continue that research and development so that we can systematize it. Like we've done the regulations, we've worked on the food safety, we struggled with the economics because as you saw, you know, getting such a small, we're competing internationally, farmers are competing internationally for cheap food. And that makes it really hard sometimes for farmers to be able to, example, um, garlic, premium Minnesota garlic is going to be four times more expensive than commodity garlic that is shipped in from China. We know that to be a fact. We can, we can, we know that to be a fact. So we're, we're still working through some of those issues, but, and then I will also say from a research perspective, and I know you asked about policies, but um, there is an initiative at the U it's called forever green. And we are trying to develop a suite of crops so that farmers can expand from corn and soybeans. Um, and we're trying to develop the crop, the genetics, the, the practices for growing it, harvesting, storing it at the same time that we're developing the supply chains. And I wish I had a prop because I could show you a box of Kerns of breakfast cereal. Um, and so the point is to create these new crops. Now I, I mentioned Kernza, it's a perennial wheatgrass, which has kind of been the holy grail for wheat breeders for a long time. Like how, could we have a wheat that you plant once instead of planting it every year? Uh, plant once and then it can grow for a multiple years and you can harvest it for multiple years. And that is part of the goal with these, and that's why it's called Forever Green. So that, for example, you could plant Kernza on your farm. I could graze it in the spring, it would grow to a grain crop. We harvest the grain, make it into bread, cereal, muffins, cookies, you know, and then you could bring your cattle back in or your goats or your sheep or whatever. You graze it one more time and then it comes up again in the spring. So it could be a multi-purpose crop. So, and our goal is to make it feasible to fit into the, fit into the cropping system so that we can ecologically expand the base of crops that are growing in Minnesota. So those are kind of two kind of policy research supply chain efforts that are, are being really spearheaded in Minnesota um, to help advance a more ecological sustainable farming. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm wondering if we might shift gears a little bit because we had a couple of questions that were asked during um, the registration that have also popped up during the Q&A. And actually the most common questions that were asked by Patrick, Jennifer, Jim, Craddock, and Susan, related to common questions about sustainable foods, meat consumption, and organic foods. And so I'm hoping we might address these two um, questions that have arisen. So first, we hear a lot that the solution to sustainable um, food supply is eating less meat. Is that true? You want to go first? You want me to go first? <laughs> <laughs> the solution to COVID is wearing a mask. That is the answer. <laughs> the answer is yes, but um, eating less meat. Okay, so so meat does have higher when you look at like a per protein basis on average. Okay, greenhouse gas impacts. Meat has higher impacts. Right. So on average, if we decrease meat, especially in the U.S., where again, we're consuming three times the global average, you, you are going to decrease your meat consumption. However, um, in preparing for this, I was doing some background research and, and came across a study that perfectly highlights 
what I think Kathy was going to point out actually is that there's so much variation, um, especially in things like cattle operations, that there are um, like beef operations and other meat operations that have a lower impact than than um, plant-based proteins, especially highly processed, you know, imported plant-based protein. Um, so, so again, on average, yes, but, but then you have this variation where if you have the ability to kind of get the best of the best in terms of sustainable meat, um, then you're actually doing better by choosing that over a particular vegetarian alternative. And so that's why I started with my thing about mass. Like it's, it's complicated. It is gray. I think it's a good rule of thumb, but it is nothing to, um, I, I don't personally believe to, to become super righteous on because there's a lot of butts and gray areas involved with it. And yes, I would agree with that. And there, we need to do some research on the systems and really be able to define the systems. Um, you know, over about the last 120 years, we have agricultural research stations that have been doing corn on corn. I mean, we have a lot of data. And we've dropped, under row crops, we've dropped our soil organic matter by half or more in some places, right? Um, and uh, because we do extents, I, so, so we know that when we have perennial cover, whatever that is, Kernza, alfalfa, hazelnuts, um, pastures. We know that our soil organic matter goes back up and we can't discount the soil as an absolutely critical sink for carbon globally. Um, I, two years ago when I got the really intensive uh, soil analysis back from my farm, I literally jumped up, like jumped up and started running around when I saw the results because I entirely expected our organic acres to be our best. I just, we just put so much into them, like in terms of, you know, we, we apply microbial mixes and, and careful fertilizers and our nutrient management and our cover crops and our green manure, like we're like all there on those, pampering those 80 organic acres. And what we found was that our soil health, and that this is an index that came from, I believe, Midwest Analytics, is they do really, they're, they're renowned for their soil health analytics. Our, our pastures, on a scale of one to 25, our pastures were over 24, and our organic acres were at 12 in terms of soil health. What was even more startling to me was that just after, I don't know, we probably had these acres under pasture now for eight years, yeah, eight years, that it's 2% higher organic matter than our, um, our uh, row crops. And, and I don't mean to go all anecdotal on you, but to say there is a need for research. And just what Jennifer said, there's a lot of if, ands, and buts, and we need to figure out what is the system. And, and even within our pastures, we have some that have deep rooted plants. Uh, we have cool season paddocks, warm season paddocks, and our tap rooted plants, that wasn't as high as our deep rooted plants. So even where we have perennial cover, we were seeing some distinctions among the plants that we planted in different paddocks. So it's, it, it, going back to what Jennifer says, um, it, is, it, it, it is not a slam dunk that eating non-organic plant-based is any better um, so you can't say that one is more um, slam dunk better than the other. I, I do agree that um, industrial meat systems, um, you know, the, the, you do need, do be judicious in what meat you buy and from where. Um, and then I'm just going to point out the issue of sugar too, just, just briefly, again, getting to some of the processed foods because um, it's, it's sugar beet harvesting season right now, which really is a pretty intensive, it's a root crop. So if we, and I like sugar and I try not to eat as much of it because really sugar is one of those processed foods that also has an impact, is ubiquitous in our diets, way, way a lot of sugar. Um, and I think doesn't contribute to our health either obesity or diabetes. And, and so in addition to meat, I think there's big things in our diets like sugar that we should be looking at and thinking about how we can uh, reduce the, that amount of processed food as well. 
So, I mean, I don't mean to open another whole can of worms. <laughs> we do grow sugar in Minnesota. Um, and sugar actually, if, you, if you've read the uh, 1619 Project, sugar actually has a pretty devastating uh, history in our country in terms of, um, you know, the use of slave, slavery to harvest sugar. I mean, that's obviously not the, you know, I mean, I know it's 2020 now, but sugar still has a lot of impact societally that we need to really think about um, as well. Thank you. So the one other sort of um, common question that we get about sustainable foods is we often hear that organic uh, farming simply cannot feed the world because it doesn't produce enough per acre as industrial farming does. And Kathy, you alluded to some of the organic farming that you do on your own farm. I'm wondering if you can kick us off by answering from your perspective, being an expert in local foods. Yeah. Um, about 10 years ago, we, the University of Minnesota Regional Partnerships, hosted a conference on campus to talk about food shed analysis. And 10 years ago, we were asking ourselves the question. It was really kind of unknown. Like, could we feed ourselves with 100% local food? Do we have enough dairy, eggs, oils, meat, fish, you know, grains? And so we did food shed analysis. We, we found some methodologies and we did food shed analysis uh, for various regions of the state. And what we found was that Slam dunk, absolutely yes. Uh, Ryan Pesh actually created a food, kind of a food shed calculator that we could plug in. Like how many acres of carrots would we need to feed Minnesotans with the RDA of carrots, right? The recommended daily allowance of carrots. Mm -hmm. the answer is absolutely yes. Even places like Northeast Minnesota, which are not prime farmland, um, we could absolutely feed ourselves on local foods. And the same applies to organic really it, it's it's pretty much a slam a slam dunk and and the answer i believe is yes um i mean i think there may be some places like so i'm talking about minnesota and absolutely 100 percent, we could use a fraction of our land keep in mind that a portion of our corn is going into actually a pretty large portion is going into ethanol production um in fact at one point, I went into the grain elevator in Clinton, Minnesota, and they told me that 100% of the corn being brought into that grain elevator was going into ethanol, 100%. So, you know, you don't have to transfer many of those acres over to carrots, potatoes, grains, you know, hazelnuts, uh, camelina, you know, canola, um, before you can actually have enough oil, nuts, you know, and food for all Minnesotans. So I don't think there, that, I think that's a question I'm very happy to say for, at least for Minnesota, asked, answered, and absolutely beyond any shadow of doubt, we can create a really healthy diet for all Minnesotans and then turn some land over back into ecosystems um, with a population that we currently have. It's not necessarily a production soils we have rain fed agriculture i'm not even talking about irrigated agriculture right i mean we actually have enough rain fed acres that we could have a healthy healthy diet that was local and organic jennifer is that true for the or uh, global supply chain no it's yeah um i feel like we're sitting in the well we are we're sitting in the northern part of the of the farm belt in one of the most fertile places in the world with amounts with technology and machinery and capacities to farm really well. So I have no doubt that what Kathy said is true. Um, and I also have not looked at studies to pull this to the global, but I would get educationally guess um, and stand by it. That, that we can't, that right now we can't feed the world doing that. And, and so this, um, you know, we're gonna have what, 2 billion new consumers by 2050, many of whom are gonna want higher um, amounts of meat. Um, and I, I think Minnesota, probably even the US in its own local version could, could create this highly sustainable local organic system but then we're, we're in essence 
saying we don't we don't care about you know those people in the, uh, elsewhere um people coming out of poverty in in africa and places in latin america and asia um and so this is where i, I often think of a global equity standpoint of like it's not just about me and and minnesota maybe we have to have large-scale mechanized ag in the u.s so that we can feed the world or so that we can feed the world frankly with environmental impacts that are lower than elsewhere so even though yes it's harmful to have this high amount of highly efficient mechanized ag um, when you compare it to the agriculture that would be occurring other places to try and to, to feed people with the same crops we're feeding then suddenly it doesn't doesn't look so bad we really should have tons and tons and tons of corn acres and so i just it's less of an answer and more of a like this is where yet another gray veil comes and says it's it's not quite that simple if we're going to consider the global population um and I, and I think that is important an important piece and, and just to link it back to another piece i wanted to mention about this global thing and that is you know the, the back to the meat consumption who are we from an equity standpoint to say that people lifting out of poverty should not be eating meat? I mean, especially again, as gluttonous Americans, right? So it's, you know, a good rule of thumb is maybe, yes, you should decrease your meat consumption so that they can increase theirs. They can eat Kathy's great meat. Um, now, as soon as you start moving things around more, right, you're going to have more impacts. But at the same time, we need to consider the fact that it's not just us. Um, Thank you. And one of, one of the things that actually has been brought up by a number of the participants is, is that one of the solutions is actually reducing our food waste. So Jennifer from St. Paul, Minnesota, and Maya from Eugene, Oregon, um, highlighted a question that there's a lot of produced food that gets wasted because there just isn't anyone to harvest or distribute it. And now with COVID-19, it seems to have exasperated this problem. So we're what they're interested in knowing is what are the practical ways of cutting the cycle of food waste short so we can get food to people who really need it yeah so i'll remind us that in the u.s it's not our biggest place of food waste in the production we've gotten that down and that's not to say it doesn't exist just that it's it's not near the level of at the consumer end um there's a couple of things for the on-farm. I mean, there are organizations that do, for instance, gleaning um, and go out to like apple orchards or farm fields and, and take the produce that for whatever reason, due to lack of um, quality or lack of uh, human power to harvest it, are, is still remaining there. And so they you know, can then take that to food shelves. Oftentimes we're dealing with perishable things though. So it, it is a tough, um not to crack to be able to get it back and then distribute it in time before it goes bad and, and there's a whole different issue with um dealing with perishable foods and, and further processing it to get it to hungry people that i will table unless we want to go there um and i also want to point out that there are nutrients in the food that's left on the field that then can get put back into the soil and so it's not this like universally bad to have some lettuce left on the field. Um, but I, I do agree that, you know, we, at least in the last few years, we have produced enough food globally to feed the world. Um, but it creates this false dichotomy because that we can't actually take all of that food that's wasted um, and actually feed it to people. There, there are pieces of it. And in many of those ways in Minnesota, we've, we've solved those. I mean, food shelves are great at getting breads and produce and meats and dairy from groceries for instance, we've, we've closed that loop um, and, and with gleaning have closed some of the loops on the on farm stuff. So I'll, I'll stop with that and see, Kathy. So I think this is another opportunity for us to be like food waste ninjas, right? So like I, I, am, I am a stickler for food waste um, and in my house and people don't have, there are limited choices. People don't get, I, I'm going to say we don't have a lot of food choice. When asparagus is in season, guess what? You can have asparagus for breakfast and for dinner uh, for quite a few days until, you know, and we freeze some for the winter as well. But I'm saying seasonality fits into this as well. So like when it's apple season, we, 
we'll have bushels of apples and you eat, it's all you can eat apples. And then we won't eat apples, you know, like as far as, far as seasonality, we, we can them and we dehydrate them. We have apple rings, but in terms of going to the store and buying fresh apples, and this is a side issue. I agree. Seasonality is a side issue, but I think it's something we can be aware of if we're interested in, you know, just equitable local and regional food systems. Um, but really be a food waste ninja. Just it's find find ways that you can use every single bit of food that enters your house and that you really have little of it that goes to waste, um, including, I don't know, maybe this is off track, but like our, our potato peelings go to chickens. And I know that's not an option for many places. You can't have a backyard chicken. And, you know, if it's a meat scrap, it'll go to a dog, our, our beloved house pets, you know? So, um, so we really work hard at having no food waste and take, you know, have a sense of pride in that in our, like just raising my kids kind of, you know, in a way that, that have a sense of pride in not having any food waste at all. So um, and what Jennifer said is right. The majority of the food waste that we do have is in our houses. And that's where we have to um, address it. Which is something that we individually can all take ownership of. And one of the ways that we individually can create a more sustainable food, food system. Um, what's the one final thought that you want to share with our participants here today? Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, so COVID has highlighted so many flaws in our food system. But it has also highlighted the fact that dealing with hard, complex problems with incomplete and changing data is also really, really difficult and something that we're not well equipped to do. And if you remember anything from this, remember the food system and changing it to sustainable, resilient, and equitable is very much just as hard and complex as dealing with COVID. And so being able to sit with these messy problems, to lean on science, to understand that science changes, and to keep trying day after day, to me is the most important take home message. Thank you. Oh, I echo everything Jennifer said, and I would just, on a hopeful note, just recognize the assets that we do have. Like we, you know, we do have a lot of small and mid-sized farms still in Minnesota. We need to recognize those assets and work to shore them up. We do have a support for emerging farmers and a lot of people that are really dedicated to making sure that farming continues and that uh, we that that we have some diversity in the farming community as well. We've got good investments in, in that area. Recognize that some of those assets might be that small little rural grocery store you pass through as you're driving through Greater Minnesota and stop there. Give them some of your food dollars because you never know when that might be the first stop on a local, on a backhaul of a local food that's going to make it into your urban neighborhood or your neighborhood someplace else. So think about the existing assets and the food that's in your house is one of those assets. So let's, we can take an asset based approach to this and really uh, try to fortify what we have um, on the landscape already. Kathy, Jennifer, thank you so much. I know we could easily talk for another hour and still not cover all of the great questions that were coming in. Um, from our participants and the ones that I have right now, but unfortunately we're out of time. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us um, for INE's People and Planet discussion on resilient food systems. Um, stay tuned for more events in the series by going to z.umn.edu people and plant backslash people and planet. You can learn about the Institute on the Environment at our webpage environment.umn.edu and here are the URLs in case you didn't have time to write them down and I'll see you at the next event. Thanks! <laughs>